because sometimes if you're misguided on that, you'll find that what you've created is something that's actually not sustainable and it's going to do you a lot of damage. You are listening to the Property Developer Podcast, your home for tips, ideas and inspiration to help take your developing to the next level. Now here's your host, Justin Getty. Hello and welcome to episode 76 of the show. Thanks for joining me. Got a fantastic conversation coming up with you today. I can't wait to bring it to you. How have you been? How are your projects going? Everything on track? I've been doing well, keeping pretty busy. My project that's under construction is making good progress. We've just about finished doing the foundations. There's only two more slabs to go and the frames are starting to be put up on some of the rear blocks of foundations which is fantastic so hopefully we can finish off the year with a strong run on my other project we have distributed a tender package to a group of builders so we're in discussions with those builders about where the price will land and any improvements that can be made the local market where we're operating in seems to be fairly robust at the moment in terms of sales so hopefully that will continue the federal government has announced the extension of the home builder program into next year although it is at a reduced rate so hopefully some buyers out there are going to jump in before the end of the year to take advantage of the full $25,000 grant that's available to them it would be great to get another couple of sales before the year is out and finish off on a strong positive note Speaking of finishing on a positive note, if you are wanting to become a property developer and next year is the year for you to do that, then don't forget we have the mentoring program that's available to help you. Email me, justin at propertydeveloperpodcast.com if you want to find out some more information. And I'm also working on bringing out an online program in the new year. So if that is something that you might be interested in, then also email me and I can share with you what I am planning. Now, before we get to today's guest, I am also very excited to let you know that the next guest I have on the show is a much requested property developer who I finally managed to track down and get on the show. So in the next episode of the Property Developer Podcast, you can look forward to hearing from Jonathan Hallinan, a well-known property developer who's doing some great projects across Australia. I'm sure you're going to enjoy listening to Jonathan's story. All right, let's get to today's guest, Rod Fairing. So Rod is the former CEO of Fraser's Australia. He recently retired from the CEO position, but he's still on the Fraser's board. Fraser's Property Australia is a massive public company that has done some huge projects across Australia. They have about a $4.5 billion portfolio of assets, so they are a really big player. And Rod has helped steer them through a period of really strong growth. Rod has a really long history in the development industry, which we'll cover. He started off small, but has gradually become involved in more complex and large projects. And he's been involved with a number of landmark developments that are dotted across the country. So we talk about Rod's early career and how he advanced up the ladder, tackling bigger and bigger projects until he was in charge of one of Australia's largest property developers. Now, I enjoyed this conversation so much that after it ended, I asked Rod for a follow-up discussion, which he kindly agreed to. And I'll bring you that in a future episode because I wanted to dive a little deeper into some of the projects and other lessons that Rod had picked up in his long and storied career. For now, enjoy this wide-ranging chat with a very entertaining and interesting Rod Fairing. And I opened by asking Rod what food he would eat until he was sick. Oh dear. What food would I eat? Mangoes. Uh, ah. Mangoes. Oh, when, uh, when they're in season, they are just um, God showing off, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got a particular uh, type of mango that you go to? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the uh, Northern Territory ones, the first season Northern Territory ones, I, I think they're called Calypso, but I could be wrong. Uh, I think they're probably top of the pops for the simple reason that they're the first time you get fresh mango um, after coming out of winter. 
and um, they just uh, they're they're pretty good. And then you get the Queensland ones coming on, and then gradually you just keep getting uh, they as the as the season moves south, uh, you get this perennial supply that uh, that runs for the best part of four and a half five months, which is brilliant. Yes, well, with my former Queensland connections, I'm always partial to a Bowen mango. So there you go. Ah, Bowen, there you are. Yeah, <laughs> they, they are. Yes, you're right. They're very good too. My daughter and her husband and their granddaughter are up in uh, far north Queensland, and uh, they speak highly of the Bowen um, uh, mango. So they've got uh, a mango tree uh, in their backyard, and um, the fruit bats, of course, deposit. Uh, mangoes, when they sort of decide that they want to take one with them, they only get out of the tree and then drop it on their tin roof. <laughs> um, they have to get up there every uh, week or so and clean off the mangoes that the fruit bats of, uh, or flying foxes have dropped on their roof. Uh, yeah. Yes. I grew up in We're... the tropics and mango trees, very common. I actually fell out of a mango tree once trying to build a tree house and cut my head open, but that's a story for another time. Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> we brought up on a farm, so uh, falling out of trees was a fairly common occurrence for me. <laughs> well, we might get to that at some point, but we're here today to talk about developing as usual, and you are a, um, a former uh, CEO now of Fraser's Property, which is a, a very big public property company in Australia, but we might get to that in a little bit. But can you give us a bit of a taste of your background and how you... Uh, got started in property or your sort of early career and then we might work our way through into how you ended up at Fraser's? Yeah, I, uh, look, I, I was um, the youngest of three sons on a farm up in uh, northern uh, Victoria, southern New South Wales and um, as a consequence, um, the prospects for me weren't so great on the farming side of things, plus the fact that I was a rubbish farmer. I didn't really know what to take to it very well. Um, so naturally, the usual thing that goes on in the bush, you have to leave um, uh, to go to uni and uh, and what have you. Um, so that's what I did. And then I, uh, I I played a lot of sport as a kid. And uh, uh, I my first job was as an industrial development officer in, uh, in, in Maryborough, <laughs> in central Victoria. Um, but I was also on the Geelong... Um, senior list at the time and I was travelling backwards and forwards from Mirira to Geelong uh, to try and play footy and I just didn't work out so um, so I had to make a choice and uh, given this was my first job, actual job that I got paid for uh, <laughs> rather than working on the farm for nothing, um, I, I chose uh, to stay with the work and then later on I got an opportunity to play with St Kilda and uh, uh, so I thought well this time I'm not going to try and do the commute thing so I got a got a, a job. I thought I'd have to get a job in Melbourne. So I, uh, the, the job I landed was um, as a project manager for uh, in the Department of Planning uh, down in Victoria. At the time, this was in the very early 80s, at the time when Melbourne was a bit of a, a rust belt um, in the recession. And, uh, and I, uh, I was part of a team of people to uh, focus on, you know, redeveloping um, Central Melbourne, so things like the South Bank project, you know, there were factories and uh, old warehouses and what have you on the uh, on the South Bank of of of, uh, uh, of the Yarra. That was one. The whole National Tennis Centre thing came on, so I, I I got involved in that sort of stuff, and that's where I first learnt how um, if you if you can combine uh, property development processes with constructive town planning frameworks with some a small amount of capital and then leverage that capital uh, from other contributors uh, you can do extraordinary things and um, now we look back on those some of those uh, assets that are still there and uh, are valued and loved by uh, by by the community broadly and part of the signature of Melbourne then you know I think that was a that was the most compelling learning experience that I had to realize that uh, what property, can do if it's thought about in a holistic way, uh, and planning is central to that. During all that, I thought I'd get a planning degree, so I did that. And um, thankfully, I've never worked as a town planner, so I, I sort of put myself aside from all of the uh, negativity that goes with 
with town planning. Well, I was going to come to that, but we might <laughs> we might come. Oh, to no, you've got a development back, with that, with that back, uh, back uh, backdrop that you've got there. Uh, yeah, let's not talk about town planning, but you know, I've been on the other side of it too. <laughs> but yeah, we are, I might get your view on town planning at some point, but uh, sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to ask you around some of those Melbourne um, sites that you worked on. What are some of them that are still there that you look at today and go, yeah, they're still functioning really well? Oh, look, I think uh, the way South Gate and, uh, and South Bank as a precinct, and then it sort of then got accelerated, nothing to do with me, but, you know, with, uh, with then Crown Casino and then uh, Jeff Shedd and all those sorts of things uh, really just transformed uh, the way uh, the city of Melbourne related to water. Because Australia, if you look, you know, you go back to the Olympics in 2000, you know, the, the way that the, those quintessential elements influence and shape how uh, a community, uh, an Australian community thinks about itself, it's fire, water, uh, as, as the two key elements of it, and because they're endemic in the way we live and they define Australia's landscape. They define uh, the hardships that uh, our landscape, you know, produces for us. So, so in an odd way, just that whole relationship with water has been a, a recurring theme um, through my career, and I learned the value of it very, very early on. But also, it sort of resonates coming from a farming background because, you know, in drought, <laughs> um, farming stuff. And um, when you see how, how, how water uh, plays a role in a landscape, you know, it, um, it, it, it's, a, it's one of those sort of fundamentals of, uh, of life and the planet. And um, using it within the development process, in my mind, is, um, is part of the part of the, the attractor, I guess, to, uh, to, to taking on larger types of projects uh, where you've got that ability. So, you know, it's, um, uh, it's funny how things sort of become themes that uh, re repeat themselves through a career. Yeah, it's funny that you should mention water and also St Kilda because I think that's an area of Melbourne that I think is really underdone in terms of the encouragement of interaction between citizens or people and the bay i think there's a lot more that could be done down there but it seems to be well, Sydney does it so well. and, yeah, and brisbane, brisbane's had some lost opportunities with the way they did their freeways and what have you but uh perth's doing now now doing it well uh in the way of they've sort of ripped, ripped the uh, the roads out and then embraced dry driven you know the swan into central perth that's going to be sensational when that's uh, completed that's nearly there now uh, Adelaide's done it extremely well. So there's this theme that when you can see everyone sort of gets it when uh, when the city and water embrace each other. Um, mind you, Adelaide probably, except for a few spots like Semaphore and what have you, haven't really engaged, embraced you know, Spencer's, you know, the Gulf there uh, to the extent that they have. And you're right, absolutely. Melbourne has yet got a long way to go towards really embracing the Bay um, more fully. And St Kilda's one of those few places where it actually touches the bay, but it's so limited and uh, there's got to be, I think we have to rethink about how we relate to the bay. Yes, um, I think the, the mayor of St Kilda has uh, said that that St Kilda triangle is where good ideas go to die, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I think I agree with him. <laughs> yeah, well, let's, not, let's not get bogged down in that. Uh, let's come back to your town planning. So you decided to do a planning degree, but you seem to not be the biggest fan of the town planning process. So how can you decide uh, to study it? Well, I, no, I, well, I studied because I thought it was, uh, it was so, so instrumental and constructive. That's why. And, um, but what I learned was how, how it, you know, the actual discipline itself is a bit of a, a an amalgam of uh, three or four, different dimensions, none of which get properly synthesized in a planning framework. By that I mean you've got you know, you've got that statutory legal um, uh, theme that runs through, which is all about the conference of development rights and compliance with you know the, the you know the codifying of the planning system. And there's a whole raft of people, lawyers and planners and all sorts of people who who are captive of that stream. They spend all of their time in compliance. Then you've got the design element, which uh, which is um, hugely important you know, in the planning process. But very few planning courses, other than the South Australians, um, the version of it really teach and develop design, uh, good design, urban design, 
Oh, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> um, excuse me. The, uh, th that element of it is really critical, and yet most everything that you do as, as a Melbourne, uh, the conference of rights and um, the, the design solution, and then you've got uh, in the middle of all of that, you know, the, far, the, the bigger uh, perspective, the strategic planning uh, piece, which rises above the site uh, to, the, to the street, to the, to the neighbourhood, um, uh, uh, to the city, to the region, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the country, to the planet. All of those relationships from a strategic point of view have a very, very strong economic uh, thing to them. And yet that's not really well enough developed in the planning education process, I don't think. Uh, and then finally, you've got, you know, the, the practicalities of doing uh, within all of this, which is buildability and the ability to be able to plan something that can be built, the ability to be able to actually understand the finance and the, and the commercial decision making processes that run around how you do stuff. And that's absent uh, as well. So when you sort of talk about planning as an umbrella for all of those four things, um, I, I'm not sure that the way it's taught uh, really amalgamates that in a way that uh, that, that brings uh, graduates out uh, into the world in a way where they can engage uh, effectively. Um, because if you if you look at you know municipal town planners, they're getting bombarded uh, all the time. Uh, by by one or of those four uh, dimensions, um, and no one is the uh, 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 to be good at all of those dimensions is is a big ask, and at the same time you pay them not much, and then you've got the political overlay on top of it. So, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, that, that's that's my view of planning. So uh, I, I I I to some respect took the easy way out and took the sort of the project management doing uh, part of it as the primary focus um, and then migrated or imported a bit of design element and I've left the legal um, aspects of it and the statutory aspects to uh, to other people who enjoy that sort of stuff. Yeah, I recently had uh, former Victorian Premier Ted Ballew on the show and we had a really fascinating discussion around planning and I think he used the words, uh, was it disappointment, delay and decay were the way he described the planning system and it was hard to disagree with him. Oh dear, it is frustrating. Yet it's you know it's essential. So um, so I think I think I think there's there's something to be to be said for planning reform, and uh, and that's not just about in a government framework, but it's also about how it's taught, uh, and you know the value that we should be placing on good good planning systems and good planning processes and good planning people uh, in the public sphere. You know, I think we've got that wrong, and I think we could, uh, we could, as a community, we should rethink uh, how that's done. All right. So you've got your planning degree, you got your paper. Then what happened? You didn't stick around at the planning department with your planning degree. You've moved on. Ah, well, like, you're gonna. <laughs> well, what, that was my second degree, so you can't last that long in government because I, I, I what I learned out of that whole experience was um, how much fun and how how rewarding development can be. And so I, uh, uh, that's when I left to, uh, to move into uh, the development sphere. Yeah, so where did you go then? Oh, I went, I went to, um, the government restructured the uh, uh, Urban Land Corporation in Victoria. So I went, I left mainstream government to a, a statutory authority. Um, uh, and at the time, this was in, where was that? Uh, yeah, this was uh, this was coming into the 1990 recession. So I've seen to sort of migrate from one recession to another when I when I changed them. So uh, in Victoria, uh, and um, at the time, uh, development the, the government was looking for a, a catalyst to stimulate um, activity. Uh, gee, it sounds ironic, doesn't it? Here we are uh, again, 30 years later. But um, uh, and the Urban Land Corporation was then designated as a, a, a to take uh, uh, public land and then redevelop it as fast as possible. Um, this is in the Kennett uh, era, and um, and I uh, I was given the task of, of, of doing that. So we uh, we put together joint ventures, development management agreements, all sorts of things to uh, to get. Uh, assets that had been declared surplus uh, by the government, we buy them, and then um, and that was a sort of a, a transfer from the state to uh, to the uh, authority, uh, and 
uh, get on and develop them. And that was a fantastic experience. Learned a lot, really interesting projects uh, from scratch, um, demolition, decontamination, remediation, re you know, reconfigured planning uh, frameworks, then, uh, then co the commercial aspect of joint venturing them, development agreements, all that sort of stuff. Um, and the governance processes that ran across it too. So, so I learned an enormous amount and um, worked really hard too and we were very successful. We, we, we achieved a lot of things uh, in that, uh, what, four years? And so, but that got me to about, what, uh, after the recession, 94, four, five, I, I was approached by the Australian Defence Industries to um, help them do exactly the same thing with the... Um, the surplus assets uh, left over from the consolidation or formation of the Australian Defence Industries, which are all their manufacturing plants. Um, and so I, uh, I got first involved then with um, the, uh, the Saltwater uh, Ammunition Factory, which is the, uh, the old um, Gordon Street um, uh, ammo factory in, uh, in Footscray. Uh, the Maribyrnong Ordnance Factory, um, the uh, Maribyrnong Explosives Factory, uh, the Raven Hall Rocket Launching uh, and Storage uh, Facility, the uh, St Mary's uh, Explosives Factory, uh, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. So all these assets, I said, all right, we'll do something with these. So, you know, that's what we did. And we, I was running a, an iron mine for a while. Um, you know, for the old Maribyrnong uh, Ordnance Factory, the, uh, that had been in operating, you know, producing drive shafts for submarines, um, uh, it, yeah, basically the, uh, the casings for huge, um, uh, huge uh, uh, shells that you, uh, you load up with, uh, with, with um, gunpowder and put a, uh, put a, a machined um, uh, rocket head on it and, uh, and that sort of stuff. So, <laughs> But we had decommissioned a lot. So uh, I, my job was to decommission and demolish uh, a, a, a thing that had been running for 135 years. And what they did was that when they had you know, surplus shavings of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of all sorts of metals, they just dump it out on the, uh, on the back end of the, uh, of the escarpment down to the Maribyrnong River. So um, when we started looking at it and we lifted some of these buildings and took up the... Uh, you know, floors, hectares of flooring that was all Jarrah wood, you know, with oil impregnated, so, you know, burnt really well. Um, but, uh, but, you know, magnificent wood, and you just scratch your head, I mean, you know, how wasteful all of this was. I remember there was one asset that, had, uh, that was a $14 million uh, machine that produced um, uh, shells for... 55 millimeter cannons and um, that only produced about, hadn't produced many, put it that way, before the decision was made to decommission all of this. So that was sold offshore. I, I hope I'm not disclosing uh, military secrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, if someone breaks down the door and drags you off, I'll uh, be sure yeah. to you'll let your lawyer know. But it was, re but it was really, and then we, you know, when we started digging around and trying to do you know, surveys and all that sort of stuff, we just kept finding you know, shavings, uh, iron shavings. And then we, the more we tested, the found we had something like about 140,000 um, tonnes of iron shavings, um, <laughs> all mixed in with dirt and sand and all sorts of stuff. So we set up a, a trommel process to sift it out with a magnetic rotator. And then um, I remember showing that to uh, to Rob McClellan because we're also in the process of getting it rezoned for, uh, for a mixed-use development. He was fascinated by it. He was the Minister of Planning at the day, so we got him out there and he, he uh, uh, observed we were running an iron mine for about you know, four and a half months to get it all out. We got it all out. And um, uh, anyway, the next thing that we, we got the rezonings through, formed a joint venture with Lend Lease and uh, um, did the same thing with St Mary's and the same thing with uh, the Saltwater Factory so that the ADI was the passive partner and Lend Lease was the development uh, partner. And... Uh, then I, I left there and joined Gelfin, uh, uh, which was a South Australian-based listed company. Um, uh, we're originally uh, general, created by the ANZ Bank and then floated in 1990. And I, was, uh, I joined there in the uh, mid-90s. Uh, and Chris Banks, um, who, who I knew from his involvement with, you know, long-term involvement with Jennings, and, uh, and he was also on the Urban Land Corporation board there for a while. So uh, 
uh, Chris was good enough to uh, to um, uh, approach me to come and work with uh, with Delphin, and um, then we we uh, we did things like Caroline Springs, um, which was eight and a half thousand dwellings. Uh, everyone thought that was you know completely mad. I'll never forget the chairman of the of Delphin when we were doing the site inspections, and he just looked around, and this was you know. A, a, 850 hectares on the fringe of Melbourne in the western suburbs. Um, it was about 38 degrees, I think, that the day we were there. A nice north wind blowing, and uh, the saffron thistles and uh, uh, were, were, were were shimmering uh, in the uh, in the wind. It, it it wasn't the best, most attractive sight that you'd ever seen, and it was billiard table flat. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, his comment was, "I hope you guys know what the hell you're doing." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, we started that project uh, first, turned the first sod in 90, late 1997 after going through the, you know, the development approvals processes and getting the joint venture uh, agreements struck, et cetera, et cetera. And um, with a view that that would take 15 years to complete, it actually took half that time. It, um, it was eight and a half thousand dwellings in just on 10 years, so about 850 transactions per annum, plus 25,000 square metres of commercial floor space, 25,000 square metres of retail floor space, which um, you know, we developed, you know, plus uh, four schools. We created new models for education, all sorts of stuff, as well as create an environment that um, you know, by literally hacking into the rock, Another example, just a little anecdote on the way. We, we'd finished the creation of the, you know, the circular lake and the uh, the whole on uh, above ground drainage system, um, which you know polished all of the runoff from housing and what have you, because the surface area was impervious uh, when you put roads down and uh, and roof area. Um, oh no, you'll never be able to keep that wet. Well, we had a surplus of, uh, of water on an ongoing basis. Because when it rains out there, it doesn't rain often, but when it rains, it really rains, and that was enough to keep it flowing. And then uh, after a few years, we came back as we're working through the project in stages. Um, one of our development applications had uh, conditions imposed on it that we weren't to touch uh, the environmentally sensitive areas that had been created uh, um, uh, in our first stages, <laughs> completely artificial, uh, because they are now habitats for uh, growling grass frogs and deerless dragons and uh, all sorts of uh, interesting other flora and fauna, um, which I, th I took as a huge compliment because I thought, well, there we go. You know, you, um, animals aren't dumb. If you create an ecosystem for them, uh, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll uh, embrace it wholeheartedly, and that's exactly what they did. So, so that was, that was uh, probably what Delphin's biggest achievement in Victoria was. Wonderful company, did wonderful things. Uh, in southeast Queensland, um, in Adelaide, uh, household name. Uh, I remember Adelaide was the uh, in got into the grand final in I think it was late '90s sometime. I don't know what it was. So the hordes of Adelaide um, uh, football fans coming over for the grand final, and uh, Delphin was the uh, was the literally the Western Highway gateway to uh, to Melbourne. Put these huge signs up, you know, Delphin welcomes uh, its its Adelaide um, supporters go Crows. And uh, the pandemonium that that created, it was, it was crazy. But, you know, nothing like parochial um, football supporters. Can I anyway, just, so... Sorry, to, can I just on. jump in? You, you mentioned that that project sold really well in half mm. the time you'd expected. What did you put that down to? Well, I mean, diversification of product. Uh, there were five elements that we, we worked to, and this is a wonderful learning experience for everyone involved. Firstly, don't, don't take what... Um, what uh, don't take um, don't allow uh, other people's perspe perceptions uh, to dictate how you design and develop a design. So the first thing was to get uh, dry western suburbs, get water uh, into the uh, into the environment. Um, and yes, that cost a lot of money, um, but that created the opportunity then to create precincts. And, you know, the traditional develop, Del Delphin model was to develop an affordable entry point product, you know, but, but very respectable in terms of the way it was presented, uh, create a, a mid-market and then a, a top-end product. And, you know, no one will believe it, but we actually sold that land, their block of land there for in excess of a million dollars, um, not just one, multiples. And uh, 
as a consequence, you know, your ability to be able to create that diversified product range creates markets within a market. So it became its own market because it had scale. So your the, the lesson learned through that is the ability to have a long-term vision, which was, you know, it's a, it was a 18, 20 year vision uh, for the project, break that down into five year uh, tranches and then break that down into annual uh, tranches and then keep relaunching the project with a new address every two years, every two years. And as a consequence, you're constantly asking the market, what's next, what's next, what's next, where can this go? And keep infusing it with um, even higher levels of, uh, of landscape, even higher levels of presentation, uh, new amenity uh, opportunities uh, that we paid for ourselves and, and put in, then create, if you like, a community um, association that valued those amenities and then get them progressively to take over and manage them themselves, uh, create employment opportunities, then we put the retail in and, you know, it, it created, if you like, a whole community that could effectively... Um, operate independently amongst itself. Uh, it could create lo local linkages between people who had come from all over the place to connect with each other. And that became a driving identity that, uh, that then translated itself into a suburb name, which translated itself into a, a degree of pride of I live there. And, uh, you know, that, that, that took, uh, took a long time to do. But, you know, when you're doing six, seven, eight, nine hundred uh, transactions a year, plus commercial transactions along the way, et cetera, um, all in a joint venture structure where we never paid for the land up front. Um, the returns that were generated from a development point of view, you know, were exponential. The returns that were generated for the landowner um, were way, way, way beyond um, expectations as well. Um, and they were, uh, they were not delivered in one, one go with everything discounted back to today. They were delivered over a period of time when the value creation process actually delivered more than could have been um, anticipated in any discount rate that was applied. And where, so, did that, you know, uh, where did that philosophical thinking come from, Rod, to, to take that approach and lift the bar, improve the landscaping, all those things that you mentioned where was the thinking or where did that thinking come from to, to focus on that? That was Delphin's intellectual property. They'd, it, was, it wasn't unique to Carolyn Springs. It was applied to Carolyn Springs. It had been done in Golden Grove, uh, where it's gen uh, but before that, West Lakes, if you know these places in, in Adelaide. Uh, then, it, um, then it was applied to a, a project in Inala in, uh, in Brisbane, which was you know, a pretty poor down and out area. Um, but Forest Lake uh, emerged from that and did exactly the same. The sorts of uh, numbers and volumes of sales, et cetera, were, were, uh, were generated there and pricing too, right next to Inala. Um, it was then applied at Wattle Grove in Sydney. It was applied um, uh, then ultimately at Springfield Lakes up in, uh, up in, uh, up in Brisbane as well. Uh, so that, that's IP and that's why Lend Lease bought Delphin uh, because we're... That, that's something that lives in the business uh, and is embodied by the people that you deploy onto projects. And so in 2000, uh, Lend Lease bought Delphin because it had, uh, it had invested in this whole space itself but was struggling to, you know, to, to really galvanise uh, or uh, drive the, uh, you know, the sort of performance that was necessary for Lend Lease uh, out of these assets, whether that be uh, up at North Lakes in, uh, in uh, northern suburbs of Brisbane uh, or St Mary's are struggling with St Mary's. Ironically, it <laughs> became full circle because the joint ventures that we put together with Lend Lease in ADI are then via Delphin then came back and um, with the acquisition of Delphin, then uh, they were part of the portfolio of projects that I was responsible for when I was appointed as CEO. Um, <laughs> so another irony just keeps repeating itself. And, uh, you know, then you know, we sort of go back on... on on, on say St Mary's, you know the frustration that uh, that was driven there again planning and uh, three municipalities, Commonwealth land, uh, state state um, Commonwealth um, tensions, uh, municipal uh, tensions between Penrith and Blacktown, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know uh, all all played out in the planning process. So you just um, shake your head. <laughs> So you're into now. You're off to lend lease, or you're part of lend lease. Mm. What happens there? What role are you playing there? 
Well, I was, I was at Lindley's, um, we, we uh, amalgamated the uh, the Delphin business, uh, integrated the Delphin business and the Lend Lease business. Uh, it's um, Master Plan Communities uh, business, and I was appointed as CEO uh, of that. So it was the largest development um, uh, business in the country. Uh, and then there was also Lend Lease development. Then a few years later, that got brought into uh, into the group as well. Um, so I was responsible for all the development work that uh, that Lend Lease was doing uh, of a residential, primarily a residential mixed use type of, uh, of nature in, uh, uh, in Australia and um, did that for what, seven years, uh, thereabouts. And um, uh, this is a sort of a, corresponded to a period where Len Lease was having some difficulties that had expanded rapidly uh, into the US and the UK, um, had bought uh, Bovis Len Lease a year or two earlier before they bought Delphin. Um, you know, the integration processes around that were difficult. Uh, trying to work out whether it was a builder or a developer or a fund manager or, or what it was and, you know, had some really rough years, um, you know, with big write-downs, impairments and things just not quite going right. During which, you know, the little business I was running, um, we, we, you know, kept it was sort of like the engine that could, if you like. We just kept uh, <laughs> delivering. <laughs> um which was which was satisfying and it was valuable for Lend Lease because it was um, it, it it sustained if you like Lend Lease's ability to be able to demonstrate that uh, uh, that within the group there was that that know how and uh, uh, focus that was able to consistently deliver and then gradually other parts of the business started to uh, to gel um, as well and then you know Lend Lease started to value that you know the large scale recognise that its real skills weren't in smaller projects or in much bigger projects and then to develop, if you like, that flywheel concept that uh, I think Len Lease is well noted for now in large urban regeneration schemes with a big development uh, building capability, I should say, development expertise that sits, um, sits uh, uh, or sets the framework uh, within which that occurs, strong uh, uh, investment management capabilities to be able to uh, securitize and manage assets as they are created uh, and, um, uh, and, and uh, optimized in terms of value and find ways to house uh, those assets uh, so that you get a collective um, uh, uh, development capability which is in world terms relatively unique and uh, and you know I was, a, I was a bit of that but you know I, I um, and I really did enjoy and learn a lot uh, about Lend Lease, but I learned more about the importance of people uh, within that. The SIP is one thing, um, but the ability to apply it uh, is another. And um, uh, the, the people management side of it, particularly being a CEO, I mean, you, you can't avoid that aspect of it. Um, that, that was a big learning uh, for me during that period of time. And then... Um, uh, and then Lindley's acquired a, um, or, you know, the GFC hat hit, and uh, then you've got um, Badcock and Brown Communities got itself into all sorts of trouble, like you know, a lot of people got into trouble uh, in the GFC, and Lindley's took a 35% interest in that, and um, uh, Steve, Steve uh, McCann asked me to, to run that, which uh, was, was an interesting process. Uh, Exhausting, I have to say. It was retirement living, aged care, uh, and I was—I'd been sort of with the development business now as CEO for oh, gee, you know seven, eight years, something like that. And um, so it was—I was probably starting to look for, uh, feeling like I was repeating myself a bit. And um, and uh, so I, I, I did that. It was a listed entity, separately listed. Um, Lendlease had a 35% interest. It was a REIT, so it was set up in a way that uh, had all the compliance and uh, RA uh, compliance obligations with it, um, reconstructed the board um, and uh, all of this during the GFC. So uh, it, was, it was difficult because you're also dealing with, it was one of the, then it was one of the largest uh, aged care um, uh, operators and uh, you know, within a relatively short period of time, I realised that this business was had a, had a cash flow problem, and you can't just sort of shut the doors on a business like that. Um, you've got some of the most vulnerable people in the community uh, dependent on you, so shutting the doors was never an option. And um, and so uh, you know, to to Len Lisa's credit, they backed um, the uh, the uh, recapitalisation of the business and. Uh, 
we went through a, a 15 month restructuring process that ultimately ended up privatizing it at the uh, at the back end uh, and then then that you know after 24 something board meetings in 15 months uh, two AGMs two EGMs <laughs> for uh, for voting in special uh, special uh, restructuring arrangements etc I'd sort of had that was enough for me. I needed uh, I needed a bit of a break because it was difficult and uh, you know restructuring debt and you know with uh, with um, banks will remain nameless uh, presenting themselves the three of them on the other side of the uh, the table um, explaining what, uh, what 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 was required from us. It was it was difficult. So, but really really testing learning experience as well, and uh, you realise that. You, uh, what's important in the scheme of things, just to be resilient through all of that, because you know, people worried about what the future held. You know, they they wanted to do the right thing, particularly in the aged care um, sector. You can't walk away from that, so you have to own up to your responsibilities and uh, and make sure you're caring for people um, to the best of your ability. And you know, we we managed to do that. What do you reckon the biggest lesson was that you took away from that, Rod? Oh, look, I, I think the observation was that why did that business get into trouble in the first place? And it was it was just, uh, look, there were some good ideas behind it, but it was the deal. You know, deals with, you know, it was grow, 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 do a transaction, grow, add another one. Here's another five over here that, you know, that was never any time spent pulling together the operating systems in a way that was coherent. The, the, uh, the internal control processes were, were weak. Um, you know the people uh, were were amalgamations. There was not a not a, a, a time spent bringing people together to um, uh, to understand what what the business's purposes was and uh, and uh, where did they fit. Now, all, all of those sorts of things, which are um, if you like legacies of rapid growth, uh, there was a necessity to pause and bring this business back to uh, into something that could could be understood and uh, that could uh, manage itself uh, from the point of view of being able to not only manage the internal controls, because you've got all you know, your reporting obligations and compliance obligations under the Aged Care Act, et cetera, as well as your obligations to, uh, to, you know, um, to, uh, to members of retirement uh, uh, communities, as well as you know, the development responsibility and the management responsibility. So none of that was sort of connected in a way that... Uh, uh, that represented, if you like, a, um, a, a, a coherent business. So the, the, the primary learning from a business perspective was just the importance of a business purpose, the importance of a culture, an operating culture that could execute, the importance of all of those, you know, sounding boring things, but, you know, the compliance arrangements, the, the IT systems that enable people to spend their time, you know, providing care as distinct from filling out pieces of paper which they invariably didn't do and so if you did fill out the piece of paper you don't get paid so you can streamline that sort of stuff and I work with some some of the best IT people I've ever ever worked with um, in that business that uh, only for a short period of time but what they did uh, in terms of improving the internal control systems in that business uh, gave it control of its cash flow and uh, you know what's what's the first thing you learn about a business You've got to control your cash flow. If you can't control your cash flow, you're not a business. You're just something else. But you're 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 just waiting for the next disaster. So, at that scale, not uh, getting control of your cash flow was really important, and um, that was the first and foremost target. So, or task, if you like. So it doesn't sound you know what's that got to do with development, what have you? But that's to do with business, and uh, that was that was for me. Uh, a, a relief and a learning at the same time because you know, I knew what the problem was, but we just had to get a hold of it and get control of it. And you know, we sold assets during the GSC, a hundred million of assets in a in a relic for like twelve months or something of that nature. Took that cash, paid down debt, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know, a, 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 a mini PhD in uh, in managing in a crisis. <laughs> Well, I'm conscious of time and we're, we're yeah. past halfway and we haven't even got to phrases yet. I've got a whole <laughs> bunch of other questions to ask you. So, um, well, shut up then. I'll, I'll, no, I'll no, 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 no. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I'm just conscious of uh, getting you away on time. That's all. But um, yeah. so you, you were to run down and tired after that experience. Did you, what, did you take a break or how did you end up at Fraser? Oh, I, I did, I, yeah, I did. I, I, uh, I, 
and Bob Johnson, Bob and I knew each other from uh, from uh, Lynn Lee's days. Bob ran the construction business, and uh, uh, and you know Bob Bob rang me one day, and we uh, we had a chat. I wanted to, I, I just had enough, and uh, we uh, we had a chat, and um, I, I joined Australian. Uh, Bob was running Australian at the time, uh, and you know, like all companies, you know, post GFC, it was also having its difficulties with its. Um, uh, with some of its assets, its residential book particularly, so I, I, I joined uh, Australand to um, to get back to what I really enjoyed, which was um, which was large scale residential development type projects. And Australand had a suite of those, but um, also had you know residual issues, difficulties uh, that had to be worked through. So so that was 2010, and uh, and I joined uh, Australand after uh, after Lend Lease, and uh, worked with Bob for. Um, <laughs> Uh, for five years, and um, uh, three of which we were subject to takeovers of various forms, uh, uh, either from GPT, um, partial takeover, or from uh, Stockland, um, uh, and then ultimately for Fraser's uh, in five years' time. But, you know, uh, what was good about that was that um, what, what I enjoyed uh, about that, well, firstly, it was the reconstruction job. I mean, there was about 60 projects thereabouts, in varying stages of development um, or non-development, uh, with all sorts of structures put together, um, and uh, what I what I did really was well, I, you know, naively I thought, well, Bob, this will take a couple of years um, to work through, but I, I think I'll get a, a handle on it in two years. I remember sitting down with Bob one day, and after two years, I said, Bob, I don't think it's going to take two years. I think it's going to take a bit longer <laughs> to, uh, to restructure because some of the deals were were were, were deals that were done in the early um, early two thousands, and you know the early two thousands was uh, was a pretty heady time, but the, the structures just didn't work anymore. So we renegotiated about half a dozen different development structures with Landcom, with um, uh, <clears throat> with the uh, city of Shoalhaven, with um, uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, you know, the market was pretty ordinary, but we were able to sort of stabilise the business so that it was contributing consistent uh, earnings. Uh, we stopped just sort of selling off chunks of projects uh, as, as had been um, the practice uh, during the GFC just to get cash in. Um, and uh, then the market started to turn in 2013 um, and we, in time because we just managed to re complete most of the re repositioning and reconstruction. Uh, 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 renegotiation, I should say, of, of different um, development structures. And what I'd also uh, brought was to sort of get Australian out of building domestic housing. Um, didn't That was not something that, uh, that Australian was good at. Um, uh, it knew how to do it, but um, needed to really shift its focus to where the real gap in the market was, which was medium density housing, sort of that three, three-storey, two, three, four-storey uh, type medium density product um, where it was sort of beyond um, the domestic home builders uh, who were building detached and semi-detached type product and not big enough for uh, for the tier two, tier three, uh, tier one uh, type builders. So that was where we focused and we had a number of projects that um, and deliberately sourced projects that were uh, uh, had that as a, as a, a key ingredient. Um, but when the market changed, we also had a, a big portfolio of, uh, of apartment products, and we moved through uh, moved through uh, those projects rapidly, which was good. Built up a lot of forward momentum, uh, and it, then as those projects settled, then we redeployed that into medium density and mixed use types projects, um, which was sort of ready for the next wave of, of where that business would go, and. Um, you know, we, we just sort of kept focused while being subject to a takeover. I'd sort of been through two of those before, so I wasn't too fussed about it. A lot of people were worried about it, but in the end, um, you know, that's a sort of a leadership task. If you if you don't uh, demonstrate that you're not worried and why you're not worried and uh, uh, and what the what the outcomes could be, and they could be just as equally positive if not negative, because my experience has always been positive. People stop worrying about it, and they just keep focused on their job, and you you keep you keep you keep people uh, people's attention on what matters. And um, and then uh, and then after uh, after an interesting period in 2014, um, Fraser's uh, turned out to be the um, uh, the buyer of the business. Which uh, on the Friday I can't remember the actual date, but it was in August sometime. No, it wasn't. It was in 
uh, it was in April uh, of 2014, um, Stockland had just uh, had, had made their, uh, their, their offer for the balance of the business. And um, that was on a Friday. Uh, and then I remember coming into, uh, uh, in, in, into the office in Sydney on the Monday and Bob says, oh, I've been to Bangkok over the weekend and um, uh, Fraser's is interested in buying Australand. <laughs> oh, okay, um, that's interesting. Um, six weeks later, they did. And they moved. Gee, they moved fast. And uh, and um, poor old stockies. I mean, it was we were we were all caught in a whirlwind. But they 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 moved fast. Um, and uh, the rest of that's history now. So that takes us to Fraser's. And then within within what three six months of that, um, I took over as MD um, and CEO from Bob because Bob GPT wanted uh, uh, wanted Bob, which was good for Bob and uh, you know good for me too. So uh, off we went. Well, that's good. Well, now I get to ask my third question on my list. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm only joking. Uh, we've answered, uh, not answered, but you've definitely covered a lot of this stuff along the way through your answers, which has been really awesome. But <laughs> I'm only joking. Um, you've moved uh, from a kind of practitioner role where you're sort of this town planner, town planning, working on the... No, I wasn't. I was a project man. I was never a town planner. I was development manager type. Sorry. <laughs> yes, that's, yes, you're correct. Sorry. You, you're in this sort of practitioner development manager type role where you're managing the projects and then your career has, has evolved and you've ascended into these very senior roles where you're a CEO and you're managing a big business what's the difference or how did you go? Did you find that a challenge moving away from the sort of the practitioner into the more strategic roles where, as you mentioned, you've got to have an understanding of the, the financial arm, the investment structures, uh, yeah. the, the whole, that, you know, the big picture side of the business, not just this project that's contained in a certain sense. Well, I think that's what I learned at Lean Lease. Um, I, I did. I did have difficulty sort of uh, adjusting from being um, because it's easy on a project because it's got it's got you know limits. You know what what it is and where it is, and you you sort of you know what your responsibilities are. Whereas when you when you're responsible for a business, you've got to not only uh, ensure that that degree of focus is applied project by project because they're mini businesses in their own right, but also how does that collection of projects then add up to something that you can then describe as being a business? Uh, and what are the ingredients there that you need to bring up um, and share and become, if you like, and formulate and crystallise as IP uh, that become then part of your brand, uh, which then becomes part of your, uh, your, your purpose. So, so I, 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 I did a lot of, a lot of, um, spent a lot of time reading and researching and, uh, uh, and you know a couple of stints at Wharton uh, Business School over in the US and uh, and what have you learning about all of that way early, and that was invaluable um, in in providing perspective, uh, and the rest of it was just hard work. Um, but but I think I think also the building blocks of, that you use. What I what I learned was that that you just got to be able to focus on the building blocks that you can then start to assemble a foundation and then you can start to crystallise uh, and bubble things up uh, in, in that environment provided you create that sort of collaborative, open, transparent type of communication environment in the teams that you've got. And those teams can be 50 people, 100 people, 300 people, 700 people. Um, the, the same principles apply uh, as long as you're focused on it and put value on it. Um, so getting your teams, your team dynamics right. So who your development managers are and making sure that they are good managers and not just good developers because sometimes the best developers can be rubbish at managing people and vice versa. Um, so there's a dynamic there. Um, and now and, and ensuring then enough control, uh, they've got enough control to be able to make decisions on the one hand, but at the same time you've also got uh, uh, control uh overarching control of how that project uh, is is funded 
how that project, the demands of capital demands on the, uh, on the, on the overall funding requirements of the business, uh, how it's contributing, whether it's creating value, uh, you know, what the options for, for improving value creation are and so on. So that, that's where you need a governance system that is, that is applied, not just sort of uh, on paper. So there is a lot of effort put then into being visible on the projects, management being visible on projects with project teams, understanding the dynamics of the project and enabling decisions to be made there locally with the authority to get on with it. Um, so that dynamic is one which, which, which was very much a, a, a Delphin-driven dynamic, the dynamic, but um, certainly consistent with how uh, Lend Lease operated, but very consistent also with, and we probably refined it a little bit for Australand too. Um, and uh, so that, that, that aspect of it was important. But then lifting up above that, the importance of brand, I always ha had a huge respect for Chris Banks and his, his articulation of what a brand stood for and how to articulate one of those. We, we refreshed the Australand brand and then in phrases again. And that, that's really important because it creates, if you like, that identification with what you do with a purpose. And uh, that, that ability to be able to communicate that simply and not in 5,000 words, but in three or four, um, was, uh, was, was, was critical. Then there's also the corporate stuff that, that sits across that, which, which does depend on good systems and good people. And uh, what I learned through all of that process is just the value of people. And um, uh, good people um, need to be valued, not only financially, but also valued as, as, uh, as individuals and their contribution. Uh, recognised um, not just numerically, uh, oh sorry, you know, financially, but um, but also from the point of the the feedback feedback loops that you provide to people. So, off the back of that, you then build a culture, um, which is one which is um, open, um, willing to uh, to receive feedback, but also give it uh, one which values getting stuff done, uh, values getting the right stuff done. Um, values the people that they work around with um, uh, in terms of the relationships they have, uh, respects uh, the management decisions that need to get made uh, on the one hand, provided they're, uh, they're well, well articulated and holding to account if, uh, if, if they're not well articulated. Um, you know, that sort of stuff was, uh, was, was, was what I'd sort of spent uh, 10 or 15 years or so uh, learning and uh, and came to fruition um, uh, at Fraser's. And so what would you say the key lessons are that you've learnt across your career or the key lesson? Well, I, yeah, look, I, I don't think there's a lesson, but I think the first one would be just you've got to be yourself. <laughs> you can't. Life's too uh, too long uh, in many respects to, uh, uh, to act being someone else. Um, so just be yourself authentically. Um, that's the first thing. Uh, my dad, that, that's, I think, one of the questions here was about what, what, what's the best advice you got. My dad, who unfortunately died very young, but his advice was, you know, get behind a tree and watch yourself go by um, because you've always got to do that on a regular basis. And if, uh, if you see yourself uh, behaving in a way that you wouldn't um, accept being, uh, uh, being, at being, if someone behaved that way with you, uh, then you've got something to do. Uh, you need to learn from it. So I think that's the first thing. Second thing is, um, look, leadership's about people and culture and uh, good cultures enable execution, bad cultures inhibit it. And uh, business is all about being able to get stuff done, the right stuff done consistently over a period of time. And so you have to have a good culture that values doing that um, and enjoys it. And uh, I think they're probably the two. And what do you reckon you've learned about yourself along the way, Rod? Um, oh, I think um, I'm probably I've, pro I've learned that I'm probably more resilient than I'd uh, than I that I thought uh, I, I I was or could be. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a I've got a fair bit of energy, and uh, and I've been able to sustain that over the years. But, uh, and that, that has a, a flow on effect to others um, because you've engaged in what they're doing rather than sort of dismissive of it because you don't have time or, or can't be bothered. Um, that, that, you know, that, that sounds simple, but 
but just the value of doing that is um, uh, means that people um, go the extra mile. And if if leadership is about enabling people to be themselves at their best, then engaging in what they're doing and valuing what they're doing is is key to it. So, and I I do define my my um, my learning as being my job uh, as a CEO is to enable people to be as good as they can be. And um, if that's happening, then a lot of other things, good things are happening too. And what do you put that energy down to? Is that just something that you've always had or have you had to work on it? Oh, look, yeah, no, to be honest, I had to work on it. But like, I think at the core of it, it's doing things that you like doing. Um, I don't think I'd be very good in insurance. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say something, but I realised. No, don't, don't, people, don't, don't. Yeah, that people work in insurance. Yeah, that's good. No, I'm sure. That, I'm sure that lots of people get a lot of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm backing off. But <laughs> no, I think we all know what you mean. Find what you really like, and um, and it doesn't feel like work. Well, that's right. I mean, it's a legacy too. I mean, we've got the privilege of creating places, you know, doing stuff that um, endures, like for you know, 30, 40, 50, 100, 150, who knows how long. And, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, no one will know who the people were who created Place X or Place Y or building this or that landscape or whatever. Um, but uh, but that's, that's very fulfilling. And then what would you say your top tip for developers out there who might be looking to take their business to the le- next level might be? Um. Yeah, I, I thought about that, and I think you've got a, probably three three things. And people who know me will always say, "Oh, you, you say three things, but you only really know two, and you make up the last one at the end." But um, I think I do have three this time. Um, the first one is, well, why do you want what 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 level you're talking about? Why do you want to do that? What's what how what do you grade? What's the grading mechanism here? Because if it's scale. Scale without quality, scale without sustainability and resilience is transitory. So, so understand what it is that, you're, uh, uh, that you consider to be uh, the grades of progress, if you like, for the next level. Because sometimes the, uh, the, if you're misguided on that, you'll find that what you've created is something that's actually not sustainable and it's going to do you a lot of damage. So... So understand what, what the next level is. So there are qualitative dimensions to that in terms of quality of product, customer service, in terms of safety performance. You now, all those qualitative ele- elements, which are critically important, and there are quantum uh, elements to it as well, you know, whether it's you know, earnings per annum, quality of uh, return that you're achieving, not necessarily the quantum, that sort of stuff. Um, so, so understand what the next level is for you. And that comes back to the individual because if you're working in it, it's your energy, you've got to be motivated by it because if you're not motivated, no one else will be. Um, and, uh, and that's the second part, do what you love. Um, and yes, you might want to go and do um, high-rise residential because you can get really nice facades and you can spend all your time on... Uh, on uh, on the uh, you know the design of the facade and uh, uh, this uh, you know the internals of the of the of the product and what have you, um, but if that's all you're there for to create an icon and not a successful development, then you know there's there's a disconnection there. Uh, you, you'll inevitably find it difficult to deliver. Other people love doing industrial and industrial is a is a wonderful business and uh, uh, and so from that point of view, your, your passion in doing what you love is key. Just because people get all, um, uh, all the accolades for doing a, a, a wonderful commercial building or something like that, which puts, uh, puts the, uh, the context of doing well-conceived industrial warehouse in good location with a high-quality tenant that delivers, you know, 7% per annum for the next 15 years uh, and then can roll over after that what's your motivation so do what you love uh, and then the third thing uh, is um, make sure you've got the right people you know, without the right people those other two things are going to be really hard to achieve and so put value on people value on the way people get uh, engaged value on the way um, uh, they're communicated with and remunerated valued in the uh, in 
uh, and respected in the decision making processes that inevitable that you've got to make commercial decisions on the way through. Um, and those three ingredients, I think, will take you a, a hell of a long way towards getting to whatever level it is you choose choose to uh, uh, to be in a business, uh, and it'll deliver also those things that are valuable to you most. And uh, only the individual who wants to take their business to that level uh, will know what those things are. Great answer. All right. What about I'm getting close to the end? This is one of the last questions I wanted to ask you. If you woke up tomorrow and you had lost everything except all your knowledge, what would you focus on uh, to rebuild again? Um, all the same things I just uh, just talked about. But look, um, um, I, I sort of when I saw that question, I thought, well, the answer is that it, it, um, you know I'll be sixty-two next month, going through well, seven days. So <laughs> the uh, what would I do again? I, yeah, the answer is uh, I'd, I'd continue to value the things that are most important to me, which is my family. And um, if I'd lost everything, well, I would feel highly motivated to make sure that my family was uh, uh, was uh, was not put at risk. And um, that would mean that I would very quickly focus on uh, what I know how to do well and uh, and get and, and enjoy doing. And once I'd got over and dusted myself off um, from the fact that I'd lost everything, I'd, <laughs> I'd have to get very, uh, very active very quickly uh, to start repairing the damage. What are you? I have to say that I wouldn't put myself in a situation where I'd gambled so much that I'd, uh, that I'd lost everything. No. That's no. just management 101. No, you, you certainly don't strike me as that kind of guy. I, I guess I was more getting towards what are the key lessons that you'd learned along the way that you would then look at maximizing uh, to get yourself back to somewhere um, pretty quickly? Yeah, well, I, I think the ones that I, we've already probably covered them, um, just being authentic and do what you love. Um, and in development terms, um, getting the structure, how you position yourself on projects at the outset uh, is where the bulk of the value is created. And if you get that right, uh, then the rest of it, relatively speaking, from the point of view of design, development, uh, um, selling, marketing, uh, um, uh, customer service, etc., are much more practical uh, uh, aspects of the transaction. But if you've got the transaction structure wrong at the, at the outset and the financial structure at the wrong at the outset, then you're always playing catch up and uh, it'll, it'll ultimately break you because the world is cyclical. There is always disruption. That's the only thing you can guarantee. So you've got to make sure that you can uh, design uh, commercial structures that uh, give you the ability to be able to um, manage through uh, inevitable uh, disruption rather than assume it never happens. And you've touched on that, so it'd be great just to get your insight quickly on those commercial structures. Or how, is that are they just hard lessons learned, or do you engage the right legal team or commercial uh, team to help you with that? There are some basic ingredients, and it, look, it'll depend on the type of asset you're trying to create and the type of uh, type of situation. But I think there's got to be shared um, um, risk and benefit. So it's got to be shared in a way where uh, where one is not exploited at the, to the advantage of the other, if a relationship's to uh, to last for a long period of time. I mean, uh, so that's the first principle. The second principle is um, direct capital towards where value is created, uh, and the what what that means is that property and property act development and uh, activities are capital hungry, always are, always will be. All property companies never have enough capital. Um, uh, don't matter how big they are, they just never do. So um, so you've got to make sure that uh, the capital that you do have in a finite uh, and constrained world is employed where it's creating value, not tied up uh, in, in, totally in terms of the, uh, the, the land asset or, or um, the procurement uh, of uh, of uh, the land control, it's, that's got to be a part of it. But, um, but it, you, if you do that, then you'll never have enough capital to actually properly execute the project. Uh, making sure that you, uh, you manage uh, debt and equity uh, in a, in a, in a uh, measured way, making sure that you get the decision-making processes uh, between the stakeholders in the project 
uh, organised so that there are no veto rights and what have you, that you're making collective decisions, not a decision that I benefit from and you don't. Um, those sorts of um, basic principles, then inevitably, you know, if, if, if uh, worse comes to worse and you've got disputes, I've never worried about those sorts of things because um, if you've got disputes, things have gone badly. So I'd rather focus on um, getting the fundamentals right so it goes well at the outset rather than uh, resolving a mess uh, when it's a mess. Um, that tends to find itself resolve anyway. So spending five months and uh, $500,000 on lawyers' fees, um, uh, finessing the uh, the default clauses, uh, I find a, a not a particularly productive use of time or effort. <laughs> well, so, um, yeah, not exactly a, a, a perfect answer, but, but there's some of the ingredients. No, no, because all I know is from a value creation point of view, when you look at the value chain, the vast bulk of the value is created on how you set the project up in the first place. Well, it sounds like we might have to have another series of longer interviews, Rod, to unpick all this stuff, tease it out, <laughs> get all your uh, intellectual knowledge out of you. But um, we're running out of time for today. So just quickly, you've, uh, what do you call yourself now? Semi-retired, retired? What, and, and what are you looking to do? Um, <laughs> well, yeah, uh, my retirement seems to have... Um, it's a bit like what George Burns said. He says... Uh, 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 proclamations of my death are, are somewhat premature, <laughs> but now I'm 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 continuous. Uh, I'm I'm just um, withdrawing from the executive function uh, at Fraser's. I'm chairman of the uh, of the Australia Property uh, Pro Fraser's Property Australia. I'll be chairman, which is the um, wholly owned subsidiary of Fraser's, chairman of uh, Australia's uh, Fraser's Property Industrial, which is the, the Australian and the uh, uh, and a European uh, business in it, chairman of uh, Fraser's Property UK, um, uh, which is a asset management development business uh, over there. Uh, and I'm um, deputy chair of the um, group um, executive committee uh, for Fraser's uh, in Singapore. So that's that's my half half job. And um, those three three <laughs> tasks. So it's more of a governance um, <laughs> oversight task. Uh, it's not working out that way, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> it, doesn't sound, it doesn't sound like it. And I've, uh, I've, I'm taking on a, uh, a role uh, as a, the chair of, or independent chair of this, um, of a uh, uh, National Affordable Housing Alliance. That's just an honorary thing. I'm, uh, I'm just trying to um, herd a bunch of cats like the ACTU and ACOS and uh, Property Council and uh, HIA and the MBA and... Uh, um, shelter, community housing association, all different bodies that I've had something to do with one way or another, uh, and the superannuation industry uh, into a uh, into the development of some policies that uh, uh, will boost the supply of, um, of of affordable and social housing um, over the course of the next ten or fifteen years, uh, and then there's another role that I'll I'll take on with um, um, uh, that that can't be announced yet because it hasn't been approved. Um, and then, then I've got my uh, my private interests. They're they're more in governance type structures, uh, which which means that I'm not uh, on doing executive stuff all the time. And then I'm going to uh, re um, uh, of of I'm going to rediscover my bike. I've been I, I I ride a lot, but uh, I'll I'll take that a little bit more seriously uh, from a. Uh, exercise and health perspective. Now that we in, can actually get outdoors as well and drive ride more than five k, what a waste of time that is! Um, is that road? So, sorry, road road bike riding or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. And we're we're looking at a property um, so I can get back to uh, to explore my uh, capabilities uh, from a farming uh, perspective. So I've got a property that uh, uh, that we'll do a bit of that um, with as well, which I've been something I've been doing for for, for a long time. Um, or well, maybe you can start that, that, growing mango cool, trees cool, cool. on your farm. Well, don't you can grow very well in here, but <laughs> <No>. <laughs> hopefully I'm better than that. <laughs> um, and our daughter has just had our first grandchild early this year, so it'll be uh, we're looking forward to um, seeing her again after all this lockdown stuff is now finally behind us, um, and uh, and spending a bit time as being a, 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 a being grandparents and. Um, so it's a pretty full, uh, I mean, looking forward to the time. It's just been a really weird six months, seven, eight months, for heaven's sake, while we've been in this twilight zone. But uh, but I'm looking forward to um, 
So that's my, if that's retirement, then that's what I'm doing. Yeah, I, I, I actually don't see how that could be described as retirement at all. <laughs> I, I just really had the yeah, idea I would be retiring. I just wanted to change orientation, that's all. Yeah, J- just quickly, if, if you had a spare hour, a free hour where you could do whatever you wanted to do, what would you choose to do with it? Well, I do have them at the moment. Um, but now it's, it's it, in my mind, it's um, spending, uh, it won't be a spare hour, but um, uh, getting to reintroduce ourselves to our granddaughter. Um, that'll be, the, uh, that'll be the, the first and foremost priority. And uh, doing that, and hopefully there are, our, our kids are going to come back from far north Queensland back to, uh, back to Victoria. And uh, if that's the case, uh, we'll do that on a much more, um, uh, much more often uh, than we might otherwise have thought possible. Just quickly, you touched on the fact that family was really important to you. Is that something that you have had to prioritise over your career or is it something you learnt along the way and you sort of rejuggled how you manage your time or how you do your t- um, how you manage your diary and things like that? Yeah, look, I, I have prioritised it over the, uh, because the only reason I can do what I do because I travel an enormous amount and uh, have done for 20-odd years, uh, whether it be onshore or offshore, um, is that my wife has, uh, has taken responsibility for keeping everything running here. And, um, uh, and so, you know, we've, we've been together for 40 years, come 40 years married for uh, uh, come next or in three or four months' time. And, um, you know, that's, that's been a, a foundation stone on, um, on being able to do what I've done because my wife does what she does. And uh, the kids are, are great. They're off our hands now. But now it's an opportunity for us to re-engage with them. So, look, the uh, the only the only um, the only enduring uh, asset uh, in the world and in your life is your family. Um, all things come and go. So, I'll, while yeah, working in success and all that sort of stuff, uh, financial success and what have you, is all good. But it is still quite transient because. Um, uh, when push comes to shove, the most valuable things in life uh, are the people you love. Very well said. Well, is there anything, any final comments you'd like to make, Rod? Um, or where can people find out more about you? Um, oh, well, uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to take a more private life, I hope. <laughs> um, the, uh, yeah, so phrases, whatever phrases is doing, you'll, you'll sort of, you'll have some in clink, but I've had, something to do with it uh, somewhere along the line. Um, so that's, that's enough, uh, I think. Uh, some of these other things, well, that'll, that'll get, uh, they'll take on their own um, uh, persona or perspective um, uh, as time goes by. But again, like, like I, I think the theme that's running through this, I'm just a, a playing a part within a broader scheme of things because no one can do, uh, do everything um, by themselves and you're dependent on, on good people um, with a common purpose. And uh, so they're the sorts of things that um, uh, will progressively become that, that I'm associated with, which hopefully will actually have some constructive outputs. Yeah, well, I think that's a common theme, isn't it, that runs from any any sized development project, whether it's small or massive, you, you just cannot do it all on your own. No, absolutely not. And uh, you're a fool to think that you could. And um, you know, the best of them, you know, you take Central Park and you know, Mick, Mick Caddy and uh, Dr. Quick, um, you couldn't get more contra- contrasting uh, individuals who, uh, who um, delivered Central Park. You know, I played a bit of a role in that, but, uh, but more of a, in a governance sort of side of things. But, you know, 40, 50, 60 people there on that project alone, let alone the thousands of contractors and uh, construction uh, employee and employees of the retail, employees of the commercial, et cetera, et cetera, the student accommodation, all that stuff um, that was put there. You know, when you, when you add it up, thousands of people were involved you know, in the delivery of that, not just one or two. Just finally, if you cast your mind back over the career and all the projects that you've done, which one stands out for you? Who's the favourite child? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, someone asked me that bef- uh, a while ago. And I look, to be honest, I could not. There are a few that are, that are, you know, quite close to my heart. But what I'd say is that what I'm most proud of is the, it's a body of work. It's not just one project. There's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be able to refer to 
20 or 30 or 50, or I can't remember how many projects we've done over the years, but or been involved in, but it would be, you know, probably close to 100, if not more. Um, and it's that body of work, whether it be a specific project uh, in built form or some specific initiatives that we've done from a management point of view or uh, change management programs that have created a culture that, um, that enable a whole lot of things to happen that would otherwise not have happened. The nature of my career has been one where there are, there are examples of all of those sorts of things. And the good thing about it is that uh, it's the collective uh, of that that I'm proudest of rather than um, one individual uh, development project uh, uh, that by itself would be, would be um, just a, a small microcosm of, uh, of, of what's going on. Well, hopefully you've got plans for a book, then you can get all these ideas down on paper, Rod. No, I haven't got plans for a no, book. Damn. Okay, <laughs> well, we'll just have to do a series of 100 podcasts with you then to try and get all that information out of your head. Anyway, I know you've, uh, you've got things to do, so I'm really grateful for you speaking with me today. I know people who are listening are going to really appreciate what you've shared with us, so thank you for coming on the Property Developer Podcast. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a really awesome chat. I'm very grateful to you. So enjoy uh, whatever, well, not retirement. Yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> my non-retirement. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rod, appreciate your time. See you later. Okay, all the best. Thank you. You've been listening to the Property Developer Podcast. Tune in next time for more tips, ideas and inspiration to take your developing to the next level. For more developing love, make sure to visit propertydeveloperpodcast.com.